Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Robin Wright. Robin, we're all so excited to have you here. So thank you very oh. much for joining us. And I can't imagine a better way for us to launch our inaugural uh, Insight Dialogue. And we're, we're delighted to well, have thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Let's jump in with House of Cards, if we may, <laughs> since I know that's, that's how many people, at least, um, think of you initially. I'll, although I know they'll walk out of here thinking about so much more. Uh, many have called Claire Underwood uh, television's greatest female character. She certainly is one of the most complex. Um, I read uh, once that you said that you can't see her as evil and cunning, that you think she's utilitarian and efficient. Now, we all both love and hate Claire. So tell us what it feels like to play her. I mean, I think that is probably the best definition for her, the efficiency. Um, and what I meant by that is I can't look through that lens as an audience member would because if, when you inhabit that person, you actually embody them, right? You have to be who they are. You have to feel what they feel. Um, so I would never want to, you know, assume that she's evil or venal, which of course she is, but, you know. <laughs> um, and it, it's interesting playing her because it's so conniving and, and it's so Machiavelli that when you're embodying somebody like that, you really go into the art of war. It's the book. I mean, it is. And that's where I think I start to learn by studying mm -hmm. that person, that character, is, is what is the art of war. Has playing Claire given you insights about politics? I mean, everybody is kind of scratching their heads right now about our political climate. Um, does it make you think about politics differently? Because you're living it in that role. Yeah, I don't think it's a surprise to any of us how corrupt it is, our administration, including uh, every other country's. Um, but I think to put the operatic veil over Mm -hmm. which is what the show produces, um, it really, it's disheartening in, in a sense because there is a truth to it. I remember sitting next to, I think it was Joe Biden's right-hand guy, and we were at the congressional dinner, and he, you know, this guy from the South, he was like, I love that show, that thing, I'm telling you, it is so accurate. And I said, <laughs> well, how much of it is accurate? He goes, about 99%. <laughs> And I said, well, what's the 1% that's not accurate? And I was thinking, you know, you don't throw a journalist in front of a subway. <laughs> Maybe some did, I'm not sure. And he thought about it for a minute, and he thought about it, thought about it, and he said, you wouldn't get an education bill passed that fast. <laughs> <laughs> it is amazing and a little scary. Um, the other part of your role that's so interesting to so many of us is the leadership component. You are a leader. I mean, there's conniving and Machiavellianism and all of that. But you stand up there and you lead, especially in the later um, parts of the series. Is being in that role teaching you anything about women in leadership? Or did you bring your own experience of leadership into it in how you play it? Uh, probably both. Um, you know, being able to collaborate so closely with the writers, uh, Kevin and I, we're, it's just such a blessing to show up every day. You know, we're 5.30 in hair and makeup and we're rewriting the scenes that we're gonna shoot at 7.30. Um, it's, it's a combination of, you know, I grew up, or rather raised my kids in a county, in Marin County, where three of the most effective and influential women were from, Barbara yeah. Boxer, Feinstein, um, and growing up with those women and seeing that kind of leadership and seeing how they serve the public, that was inspirational mm -hmm. as a young mother and wanting to be a part of the community and engage with the community and get everyone to participate with you, serving the public. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I could attest to that in House of Cards. Uh, I don't know how much they're helping the public. Um, they're manipulating the public. 
and that is that sick and delicate balance of politics, right? Because people always ask, you know, would you ever run for office? Not in a million years, but then again, I say, I'm already doing theater. <laughs> I don't need to do that theater. But you've had these amazing, powerful women in the Senate, in leadership, as role models. Would you really never consider running for political office? I, never. <laughs> never. So I would support all the way someone else. But I, I don't think it's my, it's not my game. Let's move to really thinking about ourselves as women. It's no secret when we think about and look at the data that women continue to face so many economic barriers. Um, that's certainly true in the developing world where we both work, but it's equally true when you look at the data in the developed world. So there are gaps in every sector and wages and opportunities from your business to my business to every business. Can you talk about some of the barriers that you faced in your career? I feel that the barriers, uh, the natural barriers, would be predominantly with mothers in the workplace. Um, and I experienced that personally. I was in, you know, thankfully in a two-income family. And I had the blessing of not having to work mm -hmm. financially. But I realized, looking back in my career of, you know, now 30 years plus, because I wasn't working full time, I wasn't building my salary bracket. And if you don't build salary bracket with notoriety and, you know, presence, then you're not in the game anymore. Mm -hmm. You're actually, you become a B-list actor. So I got knocked out of the A-list category saying, well, you're not box office material. You don't hold the value that you would have held if you had done four movies a year, like Nicole Kidman and Kate Blanchett did during the time I was raising my, my kids. Um, and now, you know, kind of on a comeback, you know, at 50 years old, you're mm -hmm. like, wow, now my career's back on track and mm -hmm. able to work more fluidly. And then you establish yourself. So I think that barrier it is about, it's a pandemic. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it, right? The inequality, what women earn 82% of what their male counterparts make, kind of on an average. Um, and you do have to shame and guilt them into it. Um, and I did it on my show recently. I was like, I want to be paid the same as Kevin. Because it's, it was a perfect paradigm an example to use, because there are very few films or TV shows where the male, the patriarch and the matriarch are equal. And they are in House of Cards. And I was looking at statistics, and Claire Underwood's character was more popular than his for a period of time and a season. So I capitalized on that moment. And I was like, you better pay me, or I'm going to go public. <laughs> Look, I, and they amazing. did. That's amazing. So they did. One thing women often hesitate to do is ask. And what you're saying is you must ask. It's, it's inequitable, it feels unfair. And yet if you don't ask, you may be part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And I think that's a difficult thing for many women to, to really understand. Right, it's, it's um, oh, is it Gloria Steinem has that great quote about, it's not about learning, it's about unlearning. Yeah. And I think teaching society or teaching your boss, and yes, it's, it's a male-dominant workplace society. It just, it always has been. And that's just the history and that's conditioning. So I think if women can continue to, yes, amplify their voice and demand in the great way that women can be strong and delicate at the same time, um, it's the push. It's how gentle and how forceful is that push, but it has to be unacceptable at this stage. I still keep a New Yorker cartoon on my desk that has all men and one woman sitting around a boardroom table. And the woman has just spoken, and the man at the head of the table says, that's a very interesting comment, Ms. Trigg. Now maybe one of the men would like to make it. <laughs> now, when I first cut that out, it was about 30 years ago. But there isn't a woman that I talk to, and I've been twice a CEO, 
who still somewhere has not had that experience. Mm. Has that kind of feeling ever emerged in all of the things you've been doing? Absolutely. And back to you know unlearning that tape, because it's a tape. And it's a tape for, for women as well, where we're so used to being the subordinate one. We're so used to taking that back seat. Um, and it's just, how do we join forces with the male dominant society? It's not about shunning or being, you know, this, you know, super industrial feminist or, um, it's been so bastardized, that term. And I just think we give men so much and you give us so much. We gotta work as a team. Yeah. And it's a beautiful balance, right? We couldn't just be one gender. We'd be lost.